This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So I'm Andy Gross. I uh, run the rheumatology clinic here at UCSF. And um, I'd like to thank Dr. Chow and others for inviting me to be part of the UCSF mini medical school pain series. Um, and I, I actually asked if, to speak about fibromyalgia. So um, with that, let's get going here. Um, so first of all, it's always important to point out, particularly with pain where there's such a lucrative pharmacology market um, that I have no disclosures. Actually, I'm, no one's paying me to do anything. So, um, uh, all right, so here's what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, and these are questions I get a lot. Uh, what is fibromyalgia? How common is it? How do you diagnose it? Uh, is it real? I get that question a lot. Uh, where does the pain come from? What causes it? What can I expect? I'm sort of going out farther. And how do I treat it? So we'll get to all that stuff. So let's talk about fibromyalgia. Here we go. Um, so I imagine a lot of the people in the room know something about this. But for those of you who don't, uh, what, I'm basically going to kind of go through and describe what people often tell me. And this particularly applies to women. Men most definitely get fibromyalgia, not as commonly as women. But men definitely get it, and we can get, come back later to talk a little bit more about the men's symptoms. But for women, one of the hallmark of fibromyalgia is widespread pain. So it's just pain all over their body. Um, and they usually tell me that they wake up first thing in the morning, and they have a lot of pain and a lot of stiffness. As the, day, as the morning progresses and they kind of get going, they, things loosen up a little bit. And people usually have kind of a better time sometime midday into the early afternoon. But as the day wears on, people usually tell me that the pain begins to get worse and worse. And people tell me that particularly if they've had a busy day, then the pain really gets worse and worse. So that usually by the early evening, if people have been out and about and doing a lot of errands and stuff like that, generally they tell me that by the early evening they kind of feel like they were run over by a truck. Uh, people then need to just find themselves just crashing Trying to, go, trying to get some sleep. But uh, the second hallmark of fibromyalgia is that people rarely can get a good night's sleep and almost always wake up feeling unrested. So often they spend the night uh, tossing and turning, so even though they feel like they need a crash at 5 o'clock at night, it's hardly then a respite from their discomfort. Uh, and then finally, over all that stuff, people almost always tell me that they have a huge degree of fatigue that just trying to get themselves out of bed in the morning and getting up and doing anything is a major challenge. So those are the three sort of hallmark things, widespread pain, the fatigue, and the problem sleeping. And I'll come back to that. Um, so in addition to that, people then often tell me about a variety of other things. Uh, and that's usually, and that's why I kind of pull out these figures like this and, and just kind of work from head down. So, um, so people often tell me that they have a hard time thinking. It's over and over I hear about people that they have a hard time concentrating and they have a hard time remembering things. Um, and they just feel like they're in a fog all the time. A second thing that people often tell me about, and all these things are sort of a mix and match. No one tells me about all these things, but people often tell me about some combination. For some people, it's really bad headaches. For some people, it's pretty bad jaw pain, TMJ pain. Some people, pretty bad chest pain, often prompting workups for heart attacks and stuff like that where the doctors can't find much. Um, people often have bowel problems, which are often described as 
functional bowel problems or irritable bowel syndrome, either constipation or loose stools or alternating back and forth with a sense of bloating and a lot of discomfort. Particularly if people eat the wrong thing, they'll notice they just, their stomach gives them all sorts of problems. People often tell me about urinary problems, feeling like they have to pee all the time, but not that much comes out, almost like they have a urinary tract infection. Sometimes people have a lot of problems with pelvic pain, prompting for women a lot of uh, 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 visits to see a gynecologist. Um, numbness and tingling, very prominent. You hear that a lot, and people often end up going to see neurologists and getting worked up for like multiple sclerosis and other problems. Um, skin rashes, itchy skin, that's really very irritating. Uh, and people end up going to see dermatologists looking for some underlying problem. Uh, and chemical sensitivity, so unable to tolerate different things on the skin. And, and that's, just a, that's just a short list there. In fact, people tell me about all sorts of things in addition to that. So it really is a very broad range of problems that are extremely disruptive to people's lives. Um, okay, so is this a, how big a problem is this? And it's a huge problem. I mean, it is a huge problem. So here's uh, so an awful lot of people have back pain, but obviously that's a short-lived thing, um, as well as neck pain. Osteoarthritis we see in a lot of people as they age and joints begin to wear down, and that's a huge problem, but generally later in life. Five million people, it's estimated from this National Arthritis Data Work Group, have fibromyalgia in the country. So five million. So actually, if you think about that, that's more and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus combined, as well as most of the other diseases I see. In fact, if most of these people came to, to our clinic, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. Um, so it is a massive problem. But despite that, you don't hear that much about it. Um, it's been a while since I read in the front page of the New York Times about, uh, about fibromyalgia, but you also you hear a lot about cancer. Um, so it brings me to that comment. You know, I'm right there in the room, but no one ever seems to acknowledge me, and, and that, that really is fibromyalgia. Okay. So how do I diagnose fibromyalgia? So people want to know that all the time. How do you diagnose this? Um, and people are always interested because there's no blood test, no EMG study, no procedure I can do that says you have fibromyalgia. And it's often that people want that kind of confirmation. People come to my clinic asking, do I really have rheumatoid arthritis? I have the blood test. Um, and they, 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 they feel like they can't latch on that for fibromyalgia. But actually, fibromyalgia I diagnose just like I diagnose any condition. It's almost always in what people are telling me, in addition to what I find in my physical examination. So, um, so as I said, the hallmark to fibromyalgia is widespread pain. So that's the very first thing I'm listening to for. When people are coming to our, my clinic and talking about their pain, one of the first things I want to know is, well, where is their pain? And people with fibromyalgia, it's going to be all over. Um, so I put this figure up here pointing out the fact that this woman has pain in her shoulder and her forearm and her upper neck and her upper back and the other shoulder and her lower back and her hip. And, that, and that's pretty typical. And in fact, these particular areas, the more central areas, are pretty typical. All that being said, people with fibromyalgia most definitely can have pain in their hands and their feet or anywhere farther out. But widespread pain is most definitely the norm. So that's the first hallmark to it. And then the second hallmark, as I already mentioned, is that people have a tr huge amount of fatigue that's very disruptive in their lives. They have difficulty sleeping, so they almost always tell me that at least a lot of the time they're waking up feeling like they're not getting a good night of sleep. They don't always tell me that they actually can't sleep at night or they feel like they're tossing and turning all night long, but almost always they tell me that when they wake up in the morning, they don't feel like they got a good night's sleep. And I'll come back a little bit to some of the, the details there. Um, and then finally, people often, as I mentioned before, complain about cognitive problems, difficulties thinking, difficulties concentrating, difficulties remembering stuff. Um, and so when you put those kind of two groups of things together, I'm usually pretty keyed in that it's going to be likely the person with fibromyalgia. Then I start asking about the other symptoms I mentioned before. So I'm going to ask about the problems with, uh, with headaches or chest pains and things like that. And often people are going to tell me that, in fact, they've had 
workups for all those different problems by other specialists. The specialists. That happens all the time. Yes, I've been to the cardiologist. They said they couldn't find anything wrong with my heart. Um, and that's helpful for me too because that reassures me that in fact there's not some underlying problem that in fact this all traces back to fibromyalgia. So those are the, the key hallmarks to the, making the diagnosis for me. Now there's another feature that people have probably heard about, tender points. Um, there's a lot been made about tender points. So where that came from is American College of Rheumatology developed this uh, classification criteria for the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So American College of Rheumatology does this for a lot of conditions. The reason why they want to do this is they want to have people enrolled in clinical studies where you can be pretty certain that the patient actually has that diagnosis. Since it wouldn't be very good to study the effect of some new drug in a, in, in a group of people who didn't actually have the disease you thought you were studying. So they've done this for rheumatoid arthritis, and they did it for lupus, and they did it for fibromyalgia. Now, I don't usually use the classification criteria for making any diagnosis, whether it be for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or whatever. But it's a useful guide. And so they did this with tender points. And so what they did was they identified 18 points in the body that are sensitive. Now, these 18 points are actually sensitive in anybody. Um, uh, it's fun to play with my kids. Um, so, uh, so, and, and so these are just all tender places in the body, sensitive areas in the body. But in people with fibromyalgia, when you press on them, it causes much more discomfort than one would normally expect. And so in people I often would see with fibromyalgia, I will press on these points, not to actually see if they have 11 areas that are particularly sensitive, but it does help me to gauge whether people are more sensitive to pain than what I'd ordinarily expect from most people. So these areas are mildly helpful, and sometimes people with fibromyalgia are extremely sensitive. And truth be told, some people are not particularly sensitive at all, but that doesn't necessarily sway me away from the diagnosis. Because as I said, a lot of it comes back to these two hallmarks. So the tender points are not as important to me for making the diagnosis, but I do pay attention to them. Okay, so that sort of is what I'm looking for in the diagnosis. And then, of course, there's one other key component to all this, which is making sure that someone doesn't have any other disease. Um, and that's important to do because certainly other conditions can cause chronic widespread pain and fatigue and even problems sleeping. So some of those different conditions include hypermobility syndromes, so people who are super flexible seem to run into problems with a lot of widespread pain. Um, people with endocrine diseases, sometimes diabetes, more commonly serious thyroid disease can run into this kind of problem. Um, cancer most definitely can show up this way. Not typically, but it can. Autoimmune disease, lupus most definitely can, kind of, can give a lot of these different kinds of symptoms as well as neurologic disease, the multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's. But that being said, mo almost all these conditions, usually you can find something else going on, very, and in often many things happening, either on blood tests or just talking to someone, that really clues at least me in that there's some underlying condition. It rarely comes as a major surprise to doctors when one of these conditions is, are actually present. So it actually is not a subtle art to just be able to, to identify someone with fibromyalgia as opposed to someone with lupus. Because someone with lupus is going to show up with the intense skin rashes, the very inflamed, swollen joints, things that are distinctly different than people with fibromyalgia. The one other thing that people always ask me about is infections. So all the time, everyone's wondering, well, I feel terrible. I wonder if I have an infection that we can cure with antibiotics, and then I'll go back to feeling normal. So everyone always wonders that. And the big infections people always wonder about are, are things like HIV and EBV. And then, of course, one of the big ones that come up all the time is Lyme disease. Um, but that being said, just like the other conditions, most of these things are readily distinguishable. And most of these things usually, things like EBV and flu, usually are self-limited. They go away. The symptoms go away after a while. Um, what is EBV? EBV is Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so, uh, 
so that brings me back to the fact that usually when I'm talking to someone and I'm identifying these things, and these things are usually what keys me in if someone really does have fibromyalgia, whereas all the other conditions, usually there's a lot more, com there's a lot more going on than just these two major components. Okay. So then the question is, well, what's causing the pain in fibromyalgia? Um, so I'm going to come back to this figure a lot. And so what I'm trying to describe here is a circuitry of pain signaling. And I'm going to basically break it down to two components. So there's a component peripherally, so the nerve that goes from muscles or tendons and ligaments to the spinal cord. And then there's a second nerve that brings these signals up to the brain. Okay, to the somatosensory cortex, if you want to be exact. So two major sort of connections, so the peripheral nerve and the central nerve coming on up. So, um, so that's how pain signals are generated. So then, of course, people, uh, so researchers began to ask, well, where is the pain coming from? And so they took a, a, sort of a very methodical, stepwise approach. And one of the first things that people started looking at is, is there some problem out here? Is there some problem in the muscles or the tendons or the ligaments somewhere out here that's causing all this pain? So, um, so in thinking about where pain can come from, so certainly one place for pain to come from is joints. So here's a hip joint there or the spine. Um, and then also, of course, there's the bones themselves. And then right next to the bones are often these structures bursae or bursas. Um, that are, are basically protecting the bone and providing lubrication. And a lot of different studies have looked at the joints in people with fibromyalgia, and no one's been able to find any abnormalities with the joints. Now, sometimes people with fibromyalgia can also have osteoarthritis, but that's not to say the osteoarthritis is causing the fibromyalgia. All right. So then people look at other structures, and things including muscles and the tendons that connect the muscles to the bones as well as nerves, and wondering, well, is there some problem there? Is there tendonitis, inflammation of tendons? Or is there nerve damage, like what diabetes does? Um, but in all these cases, no one's been able to find any reproducible evidence that people with fibromyalgia have any damage to any of these structures. So there doesn't seem to be a problem in the structures themselves. Well, so that then brought people to wonder, well, if there's no damage, maybe if we think about the muscles where a lot of the pain is, maybe there's some metabolic problem. Maybe the people with fibromyalgia, just something's, uh, something's different about the muscles where there's a metabolic problem that leads the muscles not working quite right, quite right and that's going to lead to pain. So a lot of studies have been done looking at muscle metabolism, doing biopsies, measuring uh, production of metabolites and what have you, and no one's been able to reproducibly find any problems there. There's definitely been studies here or there that says, yes, there's some problem, but when people have gone back and done things carefully, over and over, you haven't been able to show any, any problem that, that stands up over time. Um, so that doesn't seem to be the problem. Okay, so if the problem's not out here, so then people started wondering, well, maybe the problem is somewhere in this part, somewhere in the nerve connection. And so people started wondering, well, maybe there's something happening at the, in the nervous system that's leaving people more sensitive to pain. And the hints of that came in looking at the cerebral spinal fluid, so the, the fluid that you do from a, from a uh, spinal tap, where it was noted in various studies that there seemed to be differences in the levels of neurotransmitters that seem to be associated with pain. So there seems to be subtle differences there. And that doesn't really explain where the pain is coming from, but that gave a sense that there's something going on at the level of the central nervous system there that seems to be leading people to have more sensitivity to pain. All right, so furthering that, people started looking at how people with fibromyalgia experience pain. So researchers started looking at how they experienced pain. And so what they found is that, in fact, people with fibromyalgia are more sensitive to all kinds of different pains, whether it be the heat or the cold or the pressure. 
And so that's illustrated in this figure here. I'm going to try to avoid showing you all too many data slides because they're a little bit dry. But what this, what this slide is, is just having a researcher press with a very fixed amount of pressure, someone in, a, in the same spot in their body. And they do this for a lot of different people. And they see when they, press, when they put, do pounds per square inch, whether it causes pain. So they just ask the person, Does that, is that painful? And they found with this group of people with fibromyalgia that it was roughly one and a half pounds per square inch, or I forget what the exact units were, that was causing pain. Whereas normal people, or people without you know, chronic pain issues, were able to, actually had much higher levels of pressure that would actually then elicit pain. And then they did one other important control is to look at people with chronic pain, but in sort of a very focal area, so people with chronic low back pain. And these people, in fact, actually look more like the people without pain. So there really does seem to be something different in people with fibromyalgia about how they're sensing pain. Now, the problem with this study is it's still it's very subjective. You're asking people, what do you feel? And that's not as exact as you'd like to be. So to try to take people out, the subject, subjectivity of uh, people out of this experiment, a number of researchers have done this in a different way. And this is going to be a little bit complicated, but what the researchers made use of is this kind of reflex. So I think everyone has, has had the experience of touching something that caused acute pain, and before you know it, you've withdrawn your hand or your foot. So that's a normal pain reflex that, that actually happens faster than the signals can actually get up to your brain. So your brain is not involved in that at all. Um, so they made use of this reflex. Um, so what they're going to do is they're going to apply a stimulation out here and then let it loop through the, the spinal cord neurons there, the dorsal horn, and then come back to the muscle and they're going to measure twitching. And the way they're going to do that is something called an EMG. It's a, neuro it's a nerve or nerve neurological study that's done where you apply electrical stimulus and then actually with a needle stuck in the muscle, you can feel the needle twitch. So if you apply enough, enough stimulus here, the, the spinal cord will register pain, and then the muscle twitches, and you can measure that. Okay. And so what they did was they, they, they added increasing amounts of pain until finally the muscle twitches, uh, increasing amounts of current, electrical current, until the muscle finally twitches. And they did this with a lot of people. And the difference is not huge, but it is significant. So what they're showing here is that people with fibromyalgia had twitches at lower levels of current than people without fibromyalgia. And to me, that's very important because what it really shows is that people with fibromyalgia at, at strictly a, a, a neurological level, without even asking about it, actually the way the spinal cord is sensing pain is more sensitive than people without fibromyalgia. Um, so the point there is that you really have, the, the issue really seems to be here at the level of the, of the spinal cord and the fibers that are sensing pain. That makes sense? Okay. And so what this has been since termed is a central, so central nervous system, central sensitization to pain. Or another way to say is a pain sensitization uh, process. Okay. So that seems to be the phenomena in fibromyalgia. And not only does this apply to pain from, from the musculoskeletal areas, or what people perceived as from the musculoskeletal areas, but in fact, because this is happening at the level of the spinal cord and the central nervous system, in fact, people are more sensitive to pain signals that they perceive coming from anywhere, whether it be from the gut, from showing up as irritable bowel syndrome, or from the bladder that are sometimes diagnosed as interstitial cystitis, um, or uh, from the head, headaches, um, or from the jaw, TMJ disorder. So all these things are phenomena, can be phenomena, particularly in people with fibromyalgia, of increased sensitization to pain. And in fact, there's lots of people without fibromyalgia, so without the widespread pain part, but they do have problems with fatigue and poor sleep and they often have pain, problems with pain coming from elsewhere. So this, in fact, this phenomenon of a central sensitization to pain 
seems to apply not just to fibromyalgia, but people with all sorts of different conditions where it's hard to find some underlying disorder. So not only do five million people in the United States have fibromyalgia, but in fact a huge number of people have problems with these other different kinds of conditions. And that really may sort of signify that the same sort of process is going on there is actually applying to a lot more people. So in fact, the elephant in the room is actually a, hell, is, is a heck of a lot better, bigger than just the, the five million people with fibromyalgia. Okay. So what's causing this? You know, what's the, what, why? Why do people get this? How do they end up with this problem? Um, and we don't really have a very good or satisfying answer to that, but we have some clues. So from a variety of genetic studies done in, over the last 10 years or so, it's become increasingly clear that there is a genetic predisposition or a genetic vulnerability. So you actually can find variations in genes or single nucleotide polymorphisms that actually predispose people to pain. And the, actually, some of these mutations really run in families. Not always, but it can run in families. So there really does seem to be a genetic predisposition. So then the second thing is that it's not uncommon for people to tell me about the development of fibromyalgia after they've had some sort of traumatic experience. It's not always the case at all. And, it's not always, and sometimes this happens after they develop fibromyalgia, but then things get a whole lot worse. But it's very, quite common that people tell me about some sort of traumatic experience. So some of the things I've, he I've heard about um, are things like a pretty bad motor vehicle accident. In fact, there's been data that suggests that, in fact, people after a serious motor vehicle accident are, more, in fact, more likely to develop fibromyalgia. Other things, serious infections and other medical conditions that prompt uh, admission to hospitals and particularly intensive care units. Very common to see that. And then other just regular sorts of infections where people just feel lousy. So I mentioned earlier Lyme disease. So truth is that people often after they develop Lyme disease, we don't see it much out here, but certainly on the East Coast, people feel horrible when they have Lyme disease. They feel horrible. And then the symptoms linger and linger and linger. For most people, they recover from those symptoms, but it can take a while. But for some people, they seem to go on and develop fibromyalgia. Now we know that the bacteria is long gone. We know that. But people continue to have symptoms. And so again, that sort of points to the fact that some sort of physically traumatic event seems to predispose to the development of fibromyalgia. Okay, so then, but it's not just uh, physical trauma, it's actually emotional trauma too that can do, be just as effective at seemingly at precipitating <laughs> fibromyalgia. And this really runs the gamut. Um, and I have a sense that often people are not telling me about this but I also have a sense that this is incredibly common. One of the things that people often tell me about are the loss of a loved one. All the time I hear about people either developing fibromyalgia or having much worse symptoms after they've lost a parent um, or even more traumatic is losing a child. Um, but in addition to those kinds of losses, it's not uncommon, well, I wouldn't say it's not uncommon, but occasionally I hear about people with a more distant history of something much more traumatic, particularly sexually traumatic. Um, people are often reluctant, I think, to tell doctors about that. Um, so I don't think, I, I don't hear about it that often. Um, but I have a sense that it is actually a huge problem out there. Um, and somehow that prior trauma, whether it be violence, or sexual trauma can lead to the development of fibromyalgia. So those seem to be the, some of the things that trigger this. But as I said, that really is not a complete list and it doesn't give us a clear guide to why people actually develop fibromyalgia, but it gives us some hints. Okay. So is it important that fibromyalgia is diagnosed? Well, the answer is obviously yes to that. Um, so I think you know, from a, a more altruistic or, or societal sense, it's important because if fibromyalgia goes undiagnosed, people actually end up at, uh, racking up a lot of doctor's visits and a lot of tests. So 
Um, here's a study done by a group where they actually estimated out the, the, the expenditure of resources on people who were diagnosed with fibromyalgia versus people who were not. And what they did from their modeling is what they, or they learned from their modeling, is that in people who don't, uh, aren't diagnosed with fibromyalgia, expenses and numbers of tests go up and up and up and doctor's visits and everything else related to medical care versus people who are diagnosed with fibromyalgia, things tend to level off. So that emphasizes that by getting the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, people will spend, end up spending less time going to the cardiologist for that chest pain and going to the urologist for that, for that discomfort when they urinate and going to the neurologist because of the num numbness and tingling. Um, now, obviously, if you have fibromyalgia, well, I mean, so what? I don't really care about, about what the impact is society. Mostly, I just want to feel better, and I want to find out what's going on with these things. But I, I think it's important to also remember that, um, that if you go to doctors, odds are you're going to get a test. Um, and if you go to, go to enough doctors, you might end up with some test that's going to be abnormal, that's going to prompt even more tests. Um, and you might even end up with unnecessary procedures. Um, uh, from time to time, I think people actually have things like gallbladders taken out because of that chronic abdominal pain, where it doesn't solve any problems at all. In fact, after they've had the surgery, they may even feel worse. So I, I really emphasize to people that it, it's important to be cautious about pursuing lots of tests because it actually can lead to a lot of unnecessary things. So I think it really is important that people are diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Okay. Well, what, you know, people then want to ask, well, what's going to happen to me? Will, will I feel better someday? Um, so uh, I put up this slide. This is a slide from, uh, from Fred Wolf's group out in Kansas. Um, and I, I put it up because it, it's, it's optimistic that people's symptoms seem to go down in time, in this case over a scale of 12 years. Now, the slide's a little bit unfair. Now, this is a, a scale from 0 to 31, and I'm showing you that the average score decreased from 23 to 17, but really the scale should start at 0. So what this is pointing out is that most people 12 years later still have a lot of symptoms. You know, maybe, a, you know, an improvement of 25% over that period of time. Another study was a little bit more optimistic than that, saying people got it, um, that a reasonable percentage of people actually five years later were no longer diagnosed with fibromyalgia. But I think the, the, the jury's still out on that one. In general, my experience is, is that people's symptoms seem to wax and wane. People seem to have good months and bad months. People seem to even have good years and bad years. Um, but it's unclear to me if this will ever go away. Now, that being said, even though it might never go, to, go away, I think there's definitely things that people can do that will help control their symptoms and have them be more functional and do more things that they want to be doing. So that gets me to treatment. Um, and the thing I really want to emphasize in this part of the talk, talking about treatment, is that there's going to be no one treatment that works great. So people try medicine, and people try effects that affect the mind, and people try interventions that affect the body, and no one intervention is shown to be truly very effective. But that being said, when studies have looked at a multidisciplinary approach, then you start seeing more of a difference being made in people's symptoms. So it's very important that the people take away from this talk that there's not going to be any one thing that they should be doing. It's actually a much more comprehensive approach. Okay, so why don't we start with medicine, since that's the easiest thing to talk about. So let's go back to our model here. So there's a couple different places that we can intervene with medicine uh, as we think about this system. So one place we can intervene is, uh, is right back here at the dorsal horn. And that's with affecting norepinephrine levels. So norepinephrine is one of the neurotransmitters that's considered one of the fight or flight neurotransmitters. You know, the neurotransmitters that allow you to run away or, or, um, or, or fight back against the lion that's about to eat you. 
Um, and obviously in fight or flight, it's important not to be so much concerned about pain when you're trying to survive. So the, the uh, an approach has been taken to try to increase norepinephrine levels, which will then decrease pain levels. And there's a number of different medications that do that. So one class of medications is called the tricyclic antidepressants. Now, people, whenever I start people on something like Elevil, people always say, hey, well, why? I, I'm not depressed. I don't, I don't need an antidepressant. Um, and what I want to emphasize here is that most of these medications are antidepressants, but they're being prescribed usually at doses lower than what you'd prescribe for depression, with the goal here being that you're trying to increase norepinephrine levels to damp down pain. And also one other, one other beneficial effect of all these medications is they often allow people to sleep a little bit more deeply. I'll come back to the importance of that. So tricyclic antidepressants, as well as this group of drugs called dual reuptake inhibitors. And dual reuptake meaning um, serotonin and norepinephrine. So you're trying to increase norepinephrine levels. Now, as always with medication, there's always side effects. And these, norepinephrine tends to dry things out. So people will complain about dry eyes and dry mouth to me a lot when they're on these medicines. Um, but they're, they're reasonably effective in a limited number of people. And it's a little bit unclear to me how long that effect lasts for. So the, the studies say that probably about half of people respond to these drugs, maybe a little bit more. And the studies say that people probably have a 25% improvement in their pain. So it's not a huge improvement, but it's a solid improvement. And when you're in that much pain, you'll take 25%. Um, so they definitely play a role. It's also, as I just said, a little bit unclear to me how long they work for. It's not uncommon for me to ask someone a year later, do you think the Cymbalt is working? And people will say, I don't really know. So I think these medications are helpful in getting pain under control initially, but it's not necessarily something that's going to work for a long time. Not necessarily. I think we still need to learn more about that. Obviously, the drug companies aren't going to be um, you know, rushing to do these long-term studies. Uh, most of the studies are usually for a ha half a year tops. Um, okay, so the, the next group of drugs I want to talk about are um, ones that are in effect this level. So these are the, the, neuro, the, the nerves that are releasing neurotransmitters that then stimulate the dorsal horn nerve. And what these drugs are going to do is block the release of neurotransmitter here by these nerves. So it's going to help block that neurotransmitter release so you don't have signals coming in from the periphery. So these drugs, the, the one that you see on TV all the time is Lyrica. Uh, gabapentin is uh, the older one. Lyrica, in fact, is gabapentin, but it's just a, a different um, uh, uh, form of it. Um, but uh, in both cases, they can be helpful. People usually tell me they're more helpful for more burning type pains. So when people have tingling, burning type pain coming from anywhere in their body, these medications tend to be more helpful. But on the flip side, people often tell me that these medications often make them really sleepy or really foggy. And most of the time I find people don't like them. So I'm not particularly fond of these medications except in people who really complain about a lot of that burning type pain. Okay, so to review some of the, the data we have out there about drugs. So we, we just tried, talked about the tricyclic antidepressants, one of which is amitriptyline or Elevil. Um, the other group is the dual reuptake inhibitors. And so these are gonna increase norepinephrine levels and, um, and decrease pain and help people sleep a little better. The second group are, are, are gabapentin and pregabalin. And then a, a third, um, or a third sort of drug, if you will, that, that helps to treat um, fibromyalgia is flexoril or cyclobenzaprine. That's a muscle relaxant. And it actually does seem to be helpful in some people, although truth be told, I think a lot of it's because it actually has some effects of Elevil. So it actually is mimicking these actions. I think it's doing less to actually relax muscles and more, more centrally. And then one other drug that, that, that's out there that's shown to be somewhat effective is a drug called tramadol. 
This is uh, uh, kind of like codeine light. It's uh, it's a it's a it's a uh, uh, a opioid partial agonist. So it doesn't quite work like something like Vicodin or Oxycontin, but it does have effects that seem to be at least somewhat helpful in people with fibromyalgia. Um, that being said, it can cause a fair amount of constipation, so that doesn't always go so well. Um, other stuff. So the various NSAIDs, so the drugs I think we're mostly familiar with are, are Advil, Motrin, and Aleve over the counter. Those have been studied at length as well as other ones. And no one's been sh able to show that those are effective over, over a sustained period of time for people with fibromyalgia. Um, that being said, I sometimes recommend that for people who have pains in other areas of the body or they have a specific pain that they're trying to treat. So for example, someone who has fibromyalgia who has a lot of arthritis in their neck, they might benefit from the NSAIDs because having less pain coming from the, from the neck arthritis might actually help to improve their overall pain. So sometimes there's a role for things like Motrin and Advil on, on treating things like that. Prednisone's been looked at at length. Now, it's not uncommon for people to come in to see me who say, well, I was, uh, I was diagnosed with lupus, and I really think I have that because when my doctor treated me with prednisone, I felt much better. Um, but the truth is that you can give anyone a high dose of prednisone for anything. And in fact, the steroid effects are very, are very potent on the brain and can pe have people feel better. But that effect tends to be short-lived. And then, of course, you run into all the other side effects of prednisone. Um, and at those kinds of doses of 20 milligrams a day or more, they're extensive and can be severe um, and can ultimately lead people to have many more problems than they started out with. So I definitely steer people away from prednisone. Um, benzodiazepines, so things that help people sleep, not a big fi uh, fan of them. Often it can be helpful initially. People can say, I, I sleep so much better when I have my Ambien, um, which is uh, a semi-benzodiazepine. Um, but in general, my experience is, is that in time, people find that they can't get a good night, they can't sleep at all without taking their Ativan or the Ambien. Ambien. In fact, they end up right back in the same boat of not sleeping well and relying on these drugs to sleep at all. So they become tolerized to them. So I don't recommend benzodiazepines. There are other medicines that help sleep, like trazodone and some other ones, and, uh, and there's variable experience about how effective they are. And then finally, opioids. So I, I definitely know some rheumatologists who prescribe opioids for fibromyalgia. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, they haven't been shown to be effective over a sustained time at the same dose. Similar to my experience with benzodiazepines, I think what happens when people start on opioids, so things like Vicodin or Oxycontin, is they, they do have pain relief. Most definitely they do have pain relief. But the problem is that that pain relief, the effect tends to wane over time, and then people need a higher dose to get that same analgesic effect. And people tend to then escalate higher and higher doses, and then that, that tends to eventually have a lot of other effects on their body, including them making, having people feel very groggy and doped up. So I'm not a big fan of, of treating people with narcotics. Um, some rheumatologists say that, well, that's the only thing that's going to make a difference for some people. Their pain is just so bad. And I understand that point of view, but I think in the long term, that's gonna ultimately going to work against people. So if they do need a narcotics, I always recommend that it be for a limited amount of time and that people work very hard to try to taper themselves off of it. Okay. So that's the drugs. Um, so that, my, next, yeah, that's my next comic is, uh, ask your doctor if taking a pill to solve all your problems is right for you. And, and you know, I think we all feel like that sometimes. Like we really, you know, we, we have some problem and we just want it to be gone. And wouldn't it be easy just to, you know, take a pill and chase it down with a glass of water and you feel better. Um, but of course, unfortunately, it's not often like that. And in fact, when I ask most people if they choose to want to take pills or not, most people are going to say, no, I don't really want to take pills. In fact, if given a choice between having to take pills or other strategies, people are usually going to want to turn to the other strategies. Now, that's not always the case when they're in really, really bad pain, but 
when thinking about it in a more global sense, that's the usual choice people want. So that brings me to my, my, my next topic, which is the body. And what are things that with people with fibromyalgia can do for their body? OK, so that brings me to exercise, which has been shown over and over in multiple studies to have people feel better, sleep better, and function better. And this has been shown in many different studies with many different interventions. So the different things that I tend to talk with people about are walking, using an elliptical bike or, a, or an exercise bike, Swimming, great. Swimming's outstanding, whether it be swimming itself or water aerobics. Stretching. And Tai Chi or Qigong. Um, so a little bit about each of these. Um, so walking has been shown over and over to be the, the intervention that people are most likely to incorporate into their lives and keep up with. So I'm a fan of walking. Um, now, when I say walking, I'm not talking about, you know, walk, people always ask, well, what about, you know, walking around my house? Doesn't that count? No, that doesn't count. <laughs> so this is exercise. So what that means is that you're identifying a period of time when you're going to go out and do something good for your body. If possible, that means that you're going to go out and exercise at a pace where your heart rate's going to go up a little bit. Ideally, you might even get a little bit sweaty. Now, for some people, when they're just starting out, that might mean literally five or ten minutes. Literally, they, that's how much they can do. And then they're just wiped. Um, but what you're going for here is somewhere between 30 to 60 minutes. Somewhere in there. And it might take, it might take honestly, three to six months to get to that level. People are going to have to build up very slowly. But that's what you're aiming for. Um, and walking can be very hard for some people, particularly if you have low back problems, or a lot of pain in the sides of the hips, or a lot of arthritis in the knees. All those different things can make walking much more challenging. So then it's important to turn to something else. So bicycling sometimes can be very good for some people. I find these elliptical trainers are a little bit better because you don't have to kink your neck back, which can bother some people's neck a lot, um, and seems to be very gentle on the rest of the body. Um, as I mentioned, water aerobics and swimming are fantastic because of the zero gravity nature of water. Um, and I'm a big fan of those things. Now, of course, the problem, though, is that, um, except for my, with, with minor exceptions, it's rare that people can actually do water aerobics or swimming every day. Um, but if you can incorporate into doing at least a few days a week, that's fantastic, or even a couple times a week. Um, and the Arthritis Foundation has a lot of different programs for, for the, uh, around town for this kind of thing. Um, stretching. So as I mentioned, people with fibromyalgia have a lot of problems with stiffness. People feel really, really stiff. And having a stretching program to do every morning, I find to be really important. And it's really something that I think is important to do every morning, and ideally even twice a day. Uh, and I asked people to work with a physical therapist to develop a whole stretching program for them. Um, in working with a, a physical therapist, it's important to find a physical therapist who's familiar with fibromyalgia. People with fibromyalgia who find a sports therapist tend to come back to me saying, oh my god, he put me in these positions, I've never felt worse in my life. Um, <laughs> So it, it, it's, it's important that you find someone who's familiar with fibromyalgia and is familiar with building a very gentle program that people can add to or intensify over time to make it more effective but not, and is not immediately going to make them feel much worse. Um, in addition to just generalized stretching, it's not uncommon for me to see people with fibromyalgia with extremely tight muscle groups in specific areas often tied into some sort of problems with osteoarthritis or something like that. So I often are, are referring people to the physical therapist not just to develop a generalized stretching program, but often to focus also on specific problematic areas. So all the time I'll see someone with extremely tightened muscles in their neck from holding themselves kind of like that all the time. Or people who have very tight low back muscles and buttock muscles and a lot of pain going down the sides of the legs and they have extremely tight muscles there. And so then the, the physical therapist will build a whole program for that. Um, so I, I find that to be very helpful in addition 
to this sort of aerobic exercise. And then finally, Tai Chi or Qigong. Um, there is recently a really nice study from Tufts, my alma mater, um, uh, looking at the impact of t uh, Tai Chi on people with fibromyalgia. It was published in the very prestigious New England Journal of Medicine because it was so effective. So I'm a big fan. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, Tai Chi, it's, uh, it's a basically, a, in a sense, a martial art where people are, are doing different kinds of poses that have a combination of, uh, of an isometric element to it, um, as well as a, a, some degree of stretching. And incorporated into all that, there's also a meditative component. And that, and, and that grouping of components seems to be very effective for the management of fibromyalgia. Um, and uh, so I definitely recommend that people give that a try. Okay, so the last point I wanna make is that when you have diffuse pain, it's really hard to do these things. It's really, really hard to do these things. And all the time people come back and tell me that in fact when they did do all these things, all right, I did it, I decided I'm gonna go and I'm gonna walk 15 minutes a day and they, say, and they come back and they say, I did that for three days and that was it. I, I couldn't move for a week. Um, and so what I wanna emphasize is, is that it's important for people to start very gradually and in a very regulated sort of way. And I, in fact, encourage people to pull out a calendar and actually say what they're gonna do each day, starting with something ridiculously easy and very, very e gradually building up. And knowing that when you start on the 15th here, that, um, that I didn't even realize I was, tax I didn't even focus, that's tax day, wait a minute, you know, maybe you wanna start on the 15th. Um, uh, start before that. Um, uh, that, um, that, you're, that you're gonna recognize that you know, come the, the, the 18th, you're gonna be feeling worse probably when you first get going. But nevertheless, what you wrote is that, nope, I'm gonna to stick to it, I'm gonna do, uh, it says in the calendar, I'm gonna do 10 minutes, I'm gonna keep on going with this. And stick with what your plan is. Really important to stick with your plan. So pull out that calendar and mark what you're gonna do. So here are a lot of tips. Um, and I have this in your handout and it's completely unreadable in your handout. Um, so if you want these tips, you should send me an email just email me to andrew.gross at ucsf.edu. So now everyone on the internet's gonna have that too. Um, but actually you can get that off the UCSF website too anyway. Um, and say, hey, can I have the slides in, in a more legible format? Uh, and I'll send them to you in a bigger format. But these are, these are, 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 are helpful tips that I, I found to help you get going and, and keep going going. All right, so talked about exercise, diet. Eating healthy, what about that? Well, everyone always asks me, what should I eat, what should I eat? And the truth is that there's no convincing data that there's any one diet or any one food or any one nutrient that actually can reduce pain. So we don't have any data to look at that. And people have looked at this in a variety of different things of vegan diets and living foods diets and whatnot. Um, and there's nothing convincing. But that being said, we do know that people who um, uh, have higher body mass index, people who are obese, are more likely to have fibromyalgia. Um, and we know that people who are obese with fibromyalgia often have a reduction in symptoms when they lose significant amounts of weight. In fact, there's even a, a one study looking at bariatric surgery where people lost huge amounts of weight where actually they had major improvement in their symptoms. So what that points to me is that while there might not be any one food that's gonna actually reduce people's pain, I think eating healthy in addition to exercise is extremely important for basically taking care of your body, avoiding weight gain, and actually facilitating some weight loss. So, um, so people, as I said, always ask me, what should I eat? And I say, well, it's actually up to you but I think whatever you do, you should try to find some sort of healthy diet that actually is gonna work well for you. And there's a zillion different kinds of diet books out there that make me different suggestions. But a really good resource for that is, um, is actually the US government. So uh, the USDA, Department of Agriculture, um, came out with this uh, Dietary Guidelines for Americans in 2010. 
This is different from the old-fashioned pyramid because it really emphasizes a, a whole combination of foods, but in limited, uh, uh, limited amounts. So they emphasize that you want to kind of limit your total caloric intake. One of the very important things and hard to do in American society where you get you know, a huge platter like that to remember, no, no, no don't eat the whole thing. Um, so that in combination with physical activity. Now, for those of you who want, really want to pursue, well, what else can I do for diet? One thing that I, I do point you to is the, the sponsor of this talk is the uh, Osher Center for Integrative Medicine here at UCSF. And they have a, a lot of different people in their group who like to think a lot about diets and work with people about, uh, about modifying their diet to something that works well for you. Okay, so that's diet. So then the third part is getting a good night's sleep. Um, and obviously, as I, well, at least one of the things I mentioned at the get-go is one of the hallmarks of fibromyalgia is people feel like when they wake up, they just don't feel like they got a good night's sleep. Um, one of the interesting studies uh, uh, that came um, out of Stanford in the 1970s was a study um, uh, by this guy, Moldovsky, um, who looked at, uh, he took a bunch of um, undergrads and graduate students and he uh, hooked them up to EEGs and measured their sleep waves. Um, and each night, when they would drop into stage four sleep, so that's a deep, deep, deep relaxing sleep, not the rapid eye movement part, but the, the, the deepest, most relaxing sleep. Um, and he measured, and that's where they, people go into delta wave sleep. And whenever they would drop into delta wave sleep, he would play loud noises to pull them out of that stage four sleep. Usually not enough to wake them up, so that if you ask people, did you wake up last night, they said, well, I don't know, maybe once or twice I heard something, but no, I don't think so, I think they slept okay. Um, but after doing that for about three days, people reported that they felt like pretty much like they had fibromyalgia. They had pain all over their bodies, they had headaches, they had abdominal discomfort, they were a mess after only three days. Um, the one other cool thing about that study is they happened to have in that group three people who were athletes, uh, three people who were, uh, I think, long distance runners. And those three, they couldn't wake them up. They couldn't get them out of stage four sleep. They just went right through whatever noise you played. Um, and, 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 and I, yeah, I, I just thought that was cool. And it, 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 it reminds me that exercise is important, not just for taking care of your body, but it actually is helpful to, for taking care of your mind and getting a good night's sleep. So, um, so sleep deprivation is associated with the development of widespread pain. Um, people with fibromyalgia commonly have disturbances in their sleep. Um, and it's important to try to return to res restorative sleep. Um, and so that brings me to my next tips page, which uh, you can, um, Again, email me for, or there's, this is all over the web. Um, and these are just sleep hygiene pointers. Um, and one of, the, one of the most important things is just having a, a regular bedtime, and even more importantly, having a regular wake-up time. So you should be waking up the same time every day. Now, obviously, there's limits to what people can do, and we all have busy schedules, and we all have to do different things in our lives that doesn't always allow that. For me, it's my three-year-old who decides to come in at different times. Um, but as much as possible, trying to wake up at the same time and getting a full night's sleep is incredibly important. Okay, so that's, five, so that's, uh, so that's the, the, the sleep part. And then finally, I have to put in, I'm a doctor, I have to plug, don't smoke. Um, and in fact, there's good data that smoking makes pain worse. Now, um, now the, the, the minor caveat there is that when you stop smoking, you tend to gain weight, and then people tend to have more pain. But uh, that, again, is, that's, that's a manageable thing. In the long term, it's going to be a good thing to stop smoking. So I highly encourage people, don't smoke. Okay, so some tips. Make smart choices. Don't smoke. Eat well. Um, keep an even keel. Really important. So again, with that calendar, that people are saying, all right, this is what I'm gonna do this week, and I'm gonna stick with it. And I'm not gonna rock the boat and try to go too, super gung-ho, and I'm not gonna pull back. I'm gonna do things that are a very regular way. Um, and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Okay, so the last part 
is the mind. Um, this often gets discounted, um, in part because people are often seeing uh, medical doctors who are less trained in this area, and in part because um, of the stigma of fibromyalgia being all in people's heads. It's all in my mind. That's just made up. I don't really have, I mean, you don't really have pain. It's just all in your head. Um, and so the last thing people want to do is talk to a therapist about something going on in their mind. But in fact, it's been shown that this is incredibly important. So one of the things that's been worked out in time is actually there's a vicious cycle or a pain cycle that's present in people with any kind of chronic pain. And the, the phenomena is, is that in people with, with chronic pain, it leads to a lot of negative thinking. So anxiety, of course, over the pain, you know, because you're tired of being it, you're tired of having worse pain. Um, problems sleeping. Uh, and then pe and not coping well with the pain. And these all seem to lead into even more pain. So it becomes this sort of entwined mess. And in fact, there's pretty good data behind this. So um, at a neuroscience level. And this is pretty cool. So there's actually a whole system in place here that actually modulates pain. So not only is this nerve coming in, but there's actually a choice here where some signals can actually, instead of adding to pain, can actually reduce it. Um, Dr. Henry was talking about this last week, about when you, you, you whack yourself, um, then there's a tendency to then rub the site that you whacked. And that rubbing is actually stimulating different fibers that are actually going to in, inhibit pain signals. So that's the idea to that, that there, there's actually, coming from the periphery, there's ways to stimulate nerves that actually give inhibitory signals to modulate pain. So there's a lot of complexity there. But even adding to that level of complexity, there's actually descending fibers. So fibers coming down from the brain that can modulate this. And they can, they can, they can increase it, and so to block pain, or they can take it away to actually make pain worse. And one of the things that's been appreciated is that negative thinking, if you will, so depression or anxiety or catastrophizing, really, oh my god, this pain's the worst in the world, that actually can, is shown to lead to pain getting worse. And there's very solid neuroscience behind that. So this is clearly a problem. It actually makes pain worse. Um, so I like this slide and I like this quote. What would life be like if you could influence the way you think and feel? What would life be like if you had that much control that you just that you could you could influence the way you feel? And that brings me to this sort of peaceful looking slide and things that you actually can do to do that without taking drugs. Um, so that brings me to cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so, cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown in many different studies to be very effective. And the, 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 the tenets of it are this, that there's education the component to it, understanding the pain, or where pain is coming from. Goal setting, so recognizing that, well, you're probably not going to go out and run a marathon. But there are certain things that you should be able to expect to be able to do. Relaxation, and then as I was just alluding to, identification of dysfunctional thought, uh, dysfunctional thought patterns, and techniques to counteract negative automatic thoughts. So basically ways to challenge, you know, when you're in the mode of, this is horrible, I've never felt this bad in my life, ways to challenge that thinking. Now obviously that's not a normal thing for people to do. You know, when you're in survival mode, of just trying to get through the pain, you're not going to be thinking, all right, well, how can I challenge these negative thoughts? And that's really where cognitive behavioral therapy comes in, because honestly, you need coaching in that. You need someone to kind of teach you how to be able to do that, and do that in an effective way, where it's actually going to be able to control the pain. Um, so as I said, there's lots of different studies looking at that, lots of and fibromyalgia, showing that people's function does improve after a six or eight week course of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and in fact, even more cool, there's neuroscience to even back it up. So 
going back to this sort of thing, remember the experiment where we're actually um, putting a, a stimulus and then measuring the sensitivity in the muscle uh, with a, through the muscle twitch. So we're measuring how sensitive people are to pain. What was actually shown is that after six weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy, people's sensitivity to the stimulus went down, which is pretty cool. So after six weeks of just talking to someone, people's pain levels actually became, their people were, were, were less sensitive to pain. And not only was they less sensitive after the six weeks, but six weeks after that, not having anything afterward, people continued to have that effect. So again, I, th I thought that was pretty cool, that simply by talking to someone, you can decrease your sensitivity to pain. Um, well, talking to someone and learning techniques. So, um, so, that, so there you go. So learning how to, to challenge negative thinking helps to improve this, this uh, inhibitory response to decrease pain levels. Okay, so the, the very last thing I want to talk about is, um, is working with people in your lives and your relationships. So it's clear that fibromyalgia is extremely hard on couples. I see that all the time. It is extremely hard on couples. Um, and it's not just couples, but of course it's people's entire social structure. Um, where people feel like they have all this pain, but no one else can actually see it. And so they end up just feeling very isolated. And this was studied nicely by this group, looking at um, relationships and whether they're, and the, whether they're beneficial or detrimental. And what they found is that it kind of, not surprisingly, it divides into two groups. So um, when, there's, when people's relationships create a level of understanding and supportiveness and acknowledging their pain, that tends to be very helpful. Whereas in relationships where people's pain is discounted, and it can be discounted in one or two ways, it can either be from denying, that's obvious, right? Well, I don't see your pain, so, you know, buck up. Um, but equally problematic is this sort of thing of being patronizing. Oh, let me take care of you. You don't have to do that. And, you know, you, oh, you're, 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 you're doing too much. Um, that's also problematic. So what I, I really encourage people when I, when I see them is that it's important for them, not, not just them to learn about fibromyalgia, but in fact people in their lives to learn about fibromyalgia and its effects and what they can do together. And that I, I really, I, it hasn't been as well studied, but my sense is over and over that that's incredibly important so that people feel that the people in their lives are helping them to manage and to be more proactive in their management um, and help them feel better. Okay, so summarizing, so I summarized the medications, now I'm gonna summarize the other stuff. So um, moderate evidence for efficacy, cognitive behavioral therapy, aerobic exercise, education, group therapy. Um, a lot has been looked at for strength training and acupuncture, and there's limited evidence. I think the, the main thing we've learned about acupuncture is it's less about where the acupuncturist puts the needles. That actually seems to be less important, um, regardless of where the pain, whatever the source of pain is, whether fibromyalgia or osteoarthritis. And what's more important is that you have a very good acupuncturist who's very, whose presence is reassuring and supportive. Um, so going in and seeing acupuncturists you're not, help, you're not comfortable with, probably not a great strategy. Um, biofeedback seems to have some role, and that plays back into cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the, the Osher Center does a lot in, in this direction with something called mindfulness. Um, the very weak evidence, working with chiropractors, massage therapy, electrotherapy, ultrasound. Um, and then one thing that, that was more popular 10 years or 20 years ago were these trigger point injections, injecting uh, steroids into areas that were particularly sore. Um, and in fact, there's excellent evidence that if, those, if that does work, it doesn't matter what you inject. So the, the old studies went back and 
looked at you know injection of steroids and and it was usually steroid plus lidocaine, and so then they just or, uh, you know no, novocaine numbing medicine, and they found that there was no difference whether you just did the novocaine alone or novocaine plus the steroid. So then people well all right well what about the novocaine and the the steroid versus just you know salt water and that worked just fine, and then they said well all right. What about if we inject nothing at all? We just put the needle in and kind of twist it around. And, and that actually just works, worked just as well as everything else. So, um, so you know, that, which gets us right back to kind of that direction. So, um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that stuff. All right, so, um, so in summary, fibromyalgia represents a condition of central sensitization to pain. People are more sensitive to pain, and that's very real, that there's true neuroscience behind that. So systemic disease should be excluded, but I put that up there to emphasize that usually it's fairly readily apparent to doctors when there's a disease apparent, when there's a disease present that's actually masquerading as fibromyalgia. It's not usually a secret. Um, fibromyalgia is important to diagnose and limit unnecessary medical utilization and, un and limit the, the subjecting people from unnecessary things and procedures. And then most definitely fibromyalgia is manageable, but it takes a very conservative effort with multiple different approaches. And it's rare that you actually someone's going to be able to get away with just taking a pill each day and feel radically better. That'd be great, but that's rarely the case. So it's real. It's manageable. Now you know what you can do. So with that, uh, I just want to say everyone can feel like the Incredibles. Uh, and I, I want to uh, point out some, uh, some help from my friends. So Bev Lear is here at the, at the, um, at the uh, um, Langley Porter Institute. Um, she's a therapist and, and really specializes in a lot that we've learned about cognitive behavioral therapy. David Clayman is, uh, heads up the sleep center here at UCSF. Um, and my wife always is, uh, is, uh, is a physician and always provides me very helpful feedback. So with that, um, and then uh, additional stuff that you can't read in your handout. Um, but this is uh, uh, off a, a journal article, and as I said, if you email me, I can give you all this stuff. But this provides a lot of uh, resources for people with fibromyalgia, both books and videotapes and websites and what have you. Uh, one final plug I want to make is for the Arthritis Foundation. They're here in Northern California, San Francisco, and they run a lot of different programs for people with fibromyalgia. They're extremely helpful, and I highly recommend that people check them out. Um, it's the Northern California uh, chapter of the Arthritis Foundation. So thank you. All right, so thanks. So I, I imagine we'll, we'll, we'll have a question or two. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, is it seen in children? Yes, it is seen in children. It's unusual in prepubescent children. So, but starting around 16 or so, Definitely, you see that frequently uh, in particularly young girls. What's the thinking about what causes fibromyalgia? What do you mean? Well, is it, you mentioned arthritis, is it an autoimmune disease? No, it's not, it's dose definitely not an autoimmune disease. So that kind of gets back to those questions you had, the, the, the earlier slides about looking at joints and muscles and tendons. And there doesn't seem to be any inflammation there. No damage, no inflammation. Um, so it most definitely is not an autoimmune disease. Um, what in terms of, and, and, and I think what I want to emphasize there is that there doesn't seem to be any, any, any structures that are, that are breaking down in the body, including nerves. That everything is actually intact. But the problem is, is the way the central nervous system is picking up pain signals. That's fundamentally the problem. So the central nervous system is actually reading things in a way where it's more sensitive. It's almost as if you change the thermostat some. So that seems to be the problem. And there seems to be these factors that lead to it, but exactly how, we don't know. Um, is the fact that uh, in certain brain scans you can see both emotional pain and physical pain showing up at the same location in the brain, yeah. is that related to the onset of fibromyalgia? Yeah, okay. So there, there are studies out there looking at things like PET scans and MRIs 
and, and how, how the brain responds to different kinds of trauma. And I think studies have looked at people with physical trauma and people have looked at emotional trauma. And so then there's a lot of effort trying to correlate what they learn in these studies from physical or emotional trauma to what is seen in people with different kinds of conditions, including fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue and things like that, and trying to extrapolate, well, what can we learn from that? And, the, and, and my response is, is that, unfortunately, I don't know enough about that research to give you all a, a decent answer on that one. Um, that would, yeah, that would be a better topic for some of the neuroscientists. Then what do you make of the fact that both emotional trauma, which whose origins are very different, yeah. and physical trauma can set off the same? Yeah, so what do I make, yeah, what do I make of the fact that, that, um, that emotional trauma or physical trauma can set it off? Um, you know, I mean, it's a tough question to answer. Um, uh, I know that, you know, in a sense, people being in pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, has very real effects on people. And I think we've, we've all seen friends and family go through those kinds of things. So and perhaps in a sense, it's not that different. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is there a, a relationship between mental illness and fibromyalgia? So actually, no. Um, for the most part, so some caveats. So things like schizophrenia do not predispose to fibromyalgia. Depression actually does not predispose to fibromyalgia. Now a lot of people with fibromyalgia have depression, but that seems to be more a, a normal response to being in pain all the time. Um, the one thing that seems to predispose to fibromyalgia is anxiety disorders. So people with anxiety disorders seem to be more likely to develop <laughs> chronic pain and chronic fatigue. Yes, sir? Yeah, so what kind of pain am I talking about? What kind of pain do people with fibromyalgia have? And, and the answer is I bet if there's people in the room, we could probably get a different answer uh, for everyone with fibromyalgia. It's completely different. And it's even more different for guys than from women. Um, uh, from guys, it tends to be much more focal and much more intense. Um, but it, it's every, it, it can be anything. So for some people, it's a burning pain. For some people, it's a throbbing pain. For some people, it's just a suppressing pain. It, it, it really is incredibly variable. So it's, it's beyond an annoyance. Way beyond an annoyance, okay. yeah. And it's way, so you know, I think one of the things to emphasize about fibromyalgia is that it's going to have some sort of functional impact. So people, I think most people with fibromyalgia will tell me that in one way or another, it's affecting the way they function, that they're less likely to do, you know, be as active and do these things with their friends. Now, there, like with all medical conditions, there's a spectrum. Some people with really, really bad, some people not so bad at all. Um, and, um, and you're not necessarily more likely to get worse and worse uh, symptoms unless certain things happen. So for example, you know, you're pretty achy, but not too bad. But then all of a sudden your mom dies. And then it's not uncommon for people to show up saying, I am so much worse. Um, or the person who um, throws her back out and spends a month in their bed and stops exercising and doing other things that they know are good for their body. And they're doing a whole lot worse. I hear that all the time. So, so there's certain things that can tip it off and make things a whole lot worse. But in terms of the quality of the pain, anything goes. Yeah. So the question is, going back to some of those last slides about, about in the, having positive relationships being supportive or negative relationships were denying or patronizing. And how do you get people to be more supportive and less patronizing or denying? You know, and, and I don't have any great answer for that because of course that's the challenge to enrolling people in some idea. 
Um, but nevertheless, that is the idea of pointing out. And hey, it may, if it works, you can say, Dr. Gross said that, um, that it is more helpful to me and I, if, if you're more supportive. And one of the things that then is helpful is if you find something that you've read or seen that helps people to better understand what you're going through, pass that on to them. How, give them a better sense. Or just talk, or if, or if they're up for it, and sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't, just talk with them about what it's like and how you've been limited and how it's affected your life. So that's definitely a challenging thing, but um, it's a really challenging thing. Um, but it does seem to be important. Yeah. So uh, I mentioned the Arthritis Foundation. Um, so there's no direct relationship to arthritis. So again, for fibromyalgia itself, you don't, there's no damage to joints. That being said, um, if you have a lot of osteoarthritis, maybe in your neck or your back or your knees, where that's a constant source of pain, that can intensify the, 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 the sensitivity to the pain and all the symptoms of fibromyalgia. Now, how did the Arthritis Foundation end up with fibromyalgia? I think that's kind of more the history of rheumatic disease in that a lot of the sensation of fibromyalgia is all in the muscles and joints and, um, and periphery. And that ultimately kind of ended up in the world of rheumatology, ended up in the world of the Arthritis Foundation. But that being said, the, I mean, the truth is, in a sense, this really doesn't belong to anyone, um, any one medical specialty, because this affects so many different parts of the body. Yeah. So there's a lot of different support groups around. Um, and uh, so a couple things about support groups. So, so one way to do it is through cognitive behavioral therapy groups. And that's actually run here through the Arthritis Foundation. Um, I mean through, sorry, run here through the Langley Porter Institute, uh, the UCSF Psychiatry Department. They have a, a support group, cognitive behavioral therapy group, I should say, for people with chronic medical conditions or depression which includes fibromyalgia. So that's one way to join a group. That won't necessarily be just fibromyalgia, but that can be helpful. There are other, the, I have, the Arthritis Foundation might be running groups, and you can check with them. And then there's often a lot of different other, um, there's a lot of websites on, on fibromyalgia, and they might sponsor groups too. The one thing I should say about just groups is that you have to be a little bit cautious when joining a fibromyalgia group. Because, again, it's incredibly important that the group is supportive and reinforcing of positive thinking, if you will, as opposed to a, a group where everyone's just complaining about things. You'll actually probably come away from the group feeling worse. <laughs> so proceed with caution. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so these are the, what, what, what are the previous terms to fibromyalgia? And there's a lot of nonspecific terms in the history. Honestly, I don't know the history of it. Um, but uh, what most definitely everyone settled on is the term fibromyalgia. It gets a little bit tricky trying to track things down in the distant literature because it was often called other things. Um, but, but yeah, everyone's pretty much settled on fibromyalgia now. Because trying to decide the genetic piece, like trying to track back through the generations where grandma had rheumatism. Yeah, and you, so, so the question is, you know, well, do, do I, am I genetically predisposed? predisposed? And my, my grandmother, she had rheumatism. And what did that mean? And we'll never know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, you had a question? Yeah, so the question is, so methadone, which of course is a narcotic. So overall, as a drug, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of methadone. Um, of course, methadone is known as being the drug that, that heroin abusers get shifted over to stop using heroin. But in fact, it's a, it's a fantastic narcotic because it's very long acting with a very steady effect. Now that being said, in general, my experience has been in people with fibromyalgia is that they need higher and higher doses to control pain levels. So yes, methadone probably will work to control pain, but people will probably need higher and higher doses and then start running into the side effects of higher and higher doses of narco narcotics. Would you use it in lieu of vitamin if one insists on? Would I use it in, instead of a different narcotic? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a funny question to answer because you know I, I'm saying well I wouldn't use one, but um, uh, I, I, sure um, if I was going to turn to one, sure.
Yeah. Yes, and I'm glad you asked that. So um, question about whether fibromyalgia shows up in vets. So absolutely. And I meant to, uh, it, it just pains me every time we send guys into harm's way because I know, and the data is, that perhaps even a third of them will experience PTSD and other problems that kind of lead into these kinds of problems. Um, and so every time we send people abroad, and I'm not saying that you know, it's not necessarily to do that, but I know that the impact on the lives of those guys is going to be profound and maybe lifelong. Um, yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. So how long ago was it described or discovered that fibromyalgia is, is attributed to this pain sensi sensitization syndrome? Um, it's a hard question to answer. With, uh, with almost any medical problem, there needs to be kind of an accumulation of data, a sort of development of a body of evidence before people begin to change the way they think about it. And particularly with something as tricky as this, there had to be a development of a lot of data. So a lot of that stuff was developed in the late 80s, but really kind of came into um, to more heavy development of understanding neuroscience in the 1990s. And the best studies have come in the, in the mid-2000s. So I think the idea started being tossed around probably 10 to 15 years ago, and more heavily accepted in the last five to 10 years. That it? That's it? All right. Thank you. Thank you all.